Have you ever considered why the very same technology that has succeeded spectacularly in one organization fails dismally in achieving some form of results in another? Do you understand the underlying implications of the technology and how that should be implemented in practice? Well, from my experience, I've seen many companies trying to implement different technologies. And to be honest, we have many technologies which are brilliant. They are working to a high level of perfection, which cannot be really put at fault. So we can mention quite a few, Oracle, SAP, Microsoft, Navision, so on and so forth, and many other types of systems that are running into place. But the matter of fact, the fact of the matter is that technology is mostly not at fault for failures in digital transformation projects. And often the culprit is the disconnection that exists between that very same technology and the people who are using it. And for this reason, I have embarked on a study to look at how do technologies and humans interact between them and what makes them communicate in a better way in order to achieve the desired results in an organization. From my initial findings, following more than 20 years of experience in managing digital projects, as well as more recently having embarked on an approach to look more closely at the factors, I can see that the disconnection between these the, the two different facts comprising of technology and humans can be succinctly summarized into six main elements. The first most important element to be considered is engagement. What do I mean by engagement? Engagement is the extent and level to which an, uh, a person is involved and is in a position to use a technology to his advantage. In other words, whether there is an element of acceptance by the stakeholder of the usefulness of the technology and the capability of that person to use that technology in a practical context. So the more practical the technology is, the more likely is that that person is going to use it in practice. So this will be quite a major feat. And I have seen many companies that have failed dismally on this front. I do remember, for example, one construction company I have worked on, worked for, that it made perfect sense to introduce automation across the whole board. But what the major stumbling block that I found was that the people who had to implement and introduce the point of origin of the transaction, which means ordering the materials, ordering the uh, number of people actually going on site, uh, ordering the equipment that need to be put in place, did not have a proper understanding of technology and how it works. So there was a strong resistance to change and implement this type of technology. And that takes really long time to get to grips with what is the problem in that case. I had another company uh, which was involved in a refueling operation and part of the process was actually to input systems in terms of how much money is actually being charged to the refueling operation and also how much fuel is being ordered. And a key stumbling block in the process was precisely their lack of knowledge and understanding of how to use that system. So it is not really uh, a really big deal to implement these technologies. The real crux of the matter is to get people to understand the technology, not fear it, and educate them in a way to use it in a more appropriate way. But it takes two to tango as well, because in most cases we expect people to adapt to technology. But have you ever thought of adapting the technology to fit the profile of people? So rather than getting the people to think in terms of how the technology works, we can use the technology in a way, in a better way, to make it more uh, intuitive and more adapt and appropriate to fit specific circumstances of people. And this is where AI is coming quite uh, handy. Why? Because AI can learn from, from the trends and experiences of people 
and it can be adapted so that the technology can be used in a more natural way in comparison to the past where we had to practically put in numbers, letters, codes and digits. Just a, a very practical example. So if you want to order, for example, uh, products for your organization, rather than having to input product codes, how about a very simple thing which is being used today, having photographs of the products so that the, the people on the ground can just click on the photograph, which they know that it is the product, and that automatically sends a signal to the system that that particular product is needed without having uh, the requisite knowledge to input product codes, product categories, product details, so on and so forth. So you're creating, creating a very human-friendly interface which encourages engagement throughout the whole, the whole chain. The second point. The second point is about the future of work. And you can see a lot of uneasiness in organizations when new technology is implemented. And this is particularly the case when you are implementing artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence, by the way, does not necessarily need to be a specific system, which is an AI system. It could be a traditional platform like an ERP, but it has some form of uh, AI inbuilt in it to help you make the right decisions. But what you find in practice is that technology is not going to replace the human. This is not something new. What uh, will happen and what is actually happening is that the type of jobs that are needed to support the technology are changing over time. And this is especially the case for AI. Why? Because in contrast to traditional uh, digital transformation implementations, which have a finite life, so they have a start date and a finish date, and their uh, value decreases over time, the value of AI-enabled systems, where they have machine learning built into the operating system, the value actually increases over time exponentially. Why? Because AI and machine learning systems are learning from the data that are, they are being fed throughout the system. So really and truly the true value of machine learning systems is not the technology itself, but the data which is being fed into the system and which is creating the new forms of knowledge that can be exploited by the organization. This means that new forms of work are indeed actually being introduced. And we talk about also, for example, trainers, AI trainers, who actually train systems to learn more about their environment and produce and develop uh, new forms of knowledge which can be used in the organization as it goes along. The third point, which I'd like to stress here as well, is understanding. And this is quite a, a very important consideration. Why? Understanding in terms of the human nature, because we frequently analyze research and data, which is based on a proxy, which means that we gauge customer satisfaction based on sales. We gauge the company performance based on profits. We use the satisfaction of employees based on employee turnover. But those, in reality, are proxy indicators. What we really need is a true measure of human cognitive uh, satisfaction and cognitive interpretation of their experience with the products and services being provided by organizations. And how can you do this? Through, there are quite a few technologies and tools available out there to make this a reality. Today we talk about, for example, neuroscience, where you have products available in the market that through, by looking at specific data, the way in which you are expressing yourself and the way in which you are behaving can actually predetermine and predict what are your real sentiment about that product or service and what are your critical views. Because what you say, even in surveys, can be radically different what you truly feel. It could either be a misguided misconception that you have about your own feelings or alternatively, you don't want really to uh, disclose what you're feeling about that product, particular product or service. So we're seeing quite a few new tools out there that are available. And by better understanding human nature, both for employees 
customers and external stakeholders, we can use that technology itself to make improvements in understanding how these stakeholders are operating to provide better products, a better work environment, and a better way to interact with the community, which all of this adds to the brand value of your own organization. So I think this is also a very fundamental point when it comes to creating a connection between the human and the technology. The fourth element is what I call democratization of decision making. In the past, we have seen many different models of decision making and the typical hierarchy of an organization is you have a board of directors, you have a senior management team, and then you have also the supporting subordinates who respond to the management of that organization. The underlying assumption of traditional hierarchy, not just in organizations, but also in civilization, is the fact that decisions are transactions and there is a transaction cost associated with a decision. So imagine, for example, if you are uh, living in a country and, as, and the country is represented by members of parliament. Imagine if for each and every decision that needs to be made in the country, a referendum is to be held, then each of that decision is not only very costly, but it takes a long time by the time it has to be made. So obviously there needs to be an element of stewardship where there is representation of other people to make decisions on your behalf. But this creates certain friction in certain areas. Why? Because just as in democracies and also organizations, we find that um, minority groups or minority uh, target segments become underrepresented and they don't benefit from the same elements as the, the mainstream population for which that organization or country is set up. So one critical example is for, uh, particularly in developing countries where you have uh, people who are severely underbanked, they don't have access to finance, for example, to banks, they don't want to, to bank them because it's not profitable for them to bank them. And to counteract this, we have new technology, which is available and provides huge potential to limit the amount of democratization uh, in the process. And we use this through uh, distributed ledger technology, which is still in its infancy, I must admit. It has been quite around for a few years, but we haven't yet seen that massive scale of implementation till present date. But through DLT, we can develop and model systems which have transaction costs that are very close to zero, and this means that we can empower people at the bottom with decision making authority in a very short in a in a very efficient way and at the same time hold them holding them accountable for those decisions so the technology is there to make organizations flatter but is the culture ready to accept that type of model i don't know i don't think so that that the com that companies are already uh, ready to accept and take on board these types of forms of decisions, which will be empowering people to make their own decisions. So this is something perhaps that in the future uh, will take a life on its own. Accessibility. So in addition to democratization of decision making, not only are you increasing the empowerment of people, but also there is another dimension, which is that you are distributing the access to product and services. So the banking sector, I have mentioned that as a key point, as a key point. But there's also the element of uh, retail, for example. So if you have areas which are not densely populated and you don't, the, the real estate doesn't justify the need to set up a specific shop in that area, the fact of the matter is that through online retailing, as we have today, it's, it's, a, very, it's a very simple technology, uh, people who could not shop before from these areas can now have access to these products and services. This is something which we as a country have experienced in Malta. Well, obviously Malta is a very small country and uh, obviously it is an island. And 
we had very limited options in terms of retailing because there are no the economies of scale do not justify retailers to get a wide variety of stock items of clothing of electronics of books so on and so forth so people had were had were heavily restricted to a limited choice of products and services but thanks to new technology and at that time obviously now it's not new technology uh, we had access to more variety we had access even to cheaper products and there was more competition that was generated in the process because now i had the option not just to go to a shop next door but i could order the things that i need online from other countries in fact Malta is one of the uh, has the, one of the highest online retailing, uh, online shopping uh, indicators in Europe. Last but not least, is the quality of life. Quality of life is of course a fundamental concept, and I firmly believe that through technology we can help humans to lead a better life. I have already alluded to the fact that of understanding. The fact that you are understanding people is already a, a point in the right direction to find ways of making them feel better. So if there is low employee morale, really truly, you can use new techni technologies and techniques to help those employees to have a better, to live a better life during their employment process. We have seen remote working during, during the pandemic, for example, which has increased significantly. So People today can work from home, uh, from the comfort of their home. They might have small kids. They can look after their kids whilst being at home. They can have access to a broad range of employee services, including counseling, including training and education, um, raising awareness. So, uh, so there are many different benefits that technology has brought about in the face of the human nature that we are really looking at. So these are all fundamental concepts which I am exploring. Uh, they are still evolving. Uh, obviously, I wanted to share some of these concepts with you at the preliminary stage. Uh, but as I go along, I will be going into more detail in each of these areas uh, to get a better understanding and knowledge, which I would like to share with you. Uh, to, in a manner, to make digital transformation projects uh, stand a better chance of success, not only for the organization, but also for all the stakeholders who are using it. Because I firmly believe that any transformation program should not limit its benefits to the shareholders, but those benefits should be distributed across all stakeholders which are impacted by the change. Thank you very much.